Good morning, University Mennonite Church. Rooted in the love of Christ, we welcome each one of you here today. We welcome your mind, your body, and spirit. We welcome your faith and your doubts, your joys and your sorrows. Wherever you come from, whatever your age, and whoever you love, whoever you are, you are welcome here. Let's pray. Lord God, we are gathered here in this place to worship you, to praise your holy name, and celebrate you as creator and artist. Thank you for this amazing world, for the wonders of summer, for fire, fireflies and birds and berries, for the moon and stars, for the universe that's too big for us to fathom, for the microscopic world that's too tiny for us to comprehend. And yet, you see each sparrow that falls. And each one of us is known. You love us with tender mercies and even delight in us. Awaken our spirits to your beauty. May we catch a glimpse of your glory today. Amen. Let's prepare our hearts and minds by watching ways the divine showed up in our lives this week.
Today's theme is about art. How does art shape our faith or impact the way we understand God? So our scriptures today are centered on the beauty of God or looking at God as creator and artist. Our call to worship um, is going to be Genesis 1, 1 to 5. Before I read that though, I'm gonna read this commentary. The first time we meet God in the story of scripture, we meet him as artist. Created is the first verb in the first sentence on the Bible's first page. Out of the flurry of God's imagination, the heavens and the earth burst into existence and teem with diversity and beauty. God could have easily spoken a monochrome cosmos into being. Why then make our multi-hued universe? Why the color spectrum? Why red strawberries and orange oranges and yellow lemons? Why mandarin fish and peacocks and chameleons? Because as Genesis 1 repeats seven times, God saw that it was good. Evidently, God cares about more than efficiency and functionality. He also cares about beauty. And God made this aesthetic declaration even before he made Adam and Eve. It follows then that something can be truly beautiful even if no human being is around to behold and declare it so. Beauty then is not merely something we as humans dream up, though thankfully we can, it also is something we can discover, something beyond and even before us. So now Genesis 1, 1 to 5. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. I'm going to light the peace lamp with a scripture from Ecclesiastes. So Ecclesiastes 3.11, Kate had one in red, because it talks about God making everything beautiful in its time. And a few verses just before that, it talks about war and peace. So I'm reading those for the peace lamp. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Table and turn to 182. I sing the mighty power of God. We will do all three verses.
right, turn to 103 now. <clears throat> we will do all four verses. I started out in a home that was at best nominally Christian. And I ended up meeting Jesus in college and I went to various churches. And I was in Northern Ohio and I went to a small Church of the Brethren church. Now this would have been good, except there were four charismatic families that infiltrated it and they were very aggressive. They had all of the uh, false winds of doctrine that were blowing through in the late 1970s. And this involved a lot of gaslighting, manipulation, trying to show their authority and everything else. It basically beat my spiritual life into a pulp. And when the job there ended up, I ended up going to Nashville. And I went down there, and one of the first things I wanted to do was find a church. So the first time I went to Nashville, I looked in the phone book, and I came up with this Assemblies of God church. And I closed the phone book and prayed again. And same church popped up. So I went there. Okay, th th this was God putting me somewhere to heal from the mess I had been in. And I ended up getting uh, close to the pastor there. His name was W.C. Langford. And he, he liked to use the W.C. because those were his first initials. Now, I didn't want to 
explain to him that the abbreviation WC meant something else everywhere else in the English-speaking world. He was not pretentious. He did not gaslight. He did not manipulate. That's basically authenticity. Yeah, he, he did not pretend that uh, his word was the word of God, which some of these others, they wanted to pretend that. Uh, I mean, he assumed you agreed with him, and largely I did, so this, this was good, and we, we got fairly close. And I kind of ended up being uh, his partner in crime when he needed to do things. And the anecdote I will throw out is from one Saturday where he'd gotten a call during the week to come out and do a funeral on Saturday morning. Now, you know, he's going to preach on Sunday, so this is really asking him something to take that day and show up somewhere. And he, he asked me if I'd ever been in Woodbury, Tennessee. And I said, yeah, I've been there once. And he says, how long do you think it would take to get there? And I said, well, about an hour and a half. And he says, well, we're supposed to be there at 10. Well, let, let's allow some time. And he can pick me up at 8, eight o'clock. So I went Saturday morning, picked him up at 8 o'clock, and off we went. And this was a real adventure, 40 miles out in them our hills east of Murfreesboro, Tennessee. This is out in the country. They, they had given him very little information. We came into town and there was a funeral home. So we, we checked and they didn't have a customer with the right name. And yes, there's another funeral home downtown. So we went downtown. Yeah, there was one person there that knew him and greeted him warmly. And this was interesting. He was winging the whole thing. I mean, the, 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 this everything he did was made up from the whole cloth because he didn't know. So you have the funeral in the funeral home. Then you go out to the cemetery. You have a graveside service. And this is not done until the hole is completely filled in. He, he knew this one person, and there was one that rode out with us. And the, the people, the guy that called him, gave him this wonderful uh, honorarium for the effort, which wasn't enough money to buy lunch. <laughs> On we went, and he, he did this because he considered it part of his ministry. And he was real. He, he, he didn't... Uh, put on anything like the Charismatics had up north. And this was a healing time for me. And a lot of his approach to things, despite being Pentecostal, wasn't necessarily that much different than Menno Simons. So this, this guy was, was, was significant in, in me being who I am now and having a spiritual connection. Psalm 27, 5 to 6. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek God in God's temple. Are there any rainbow pictures in the spot? Good. I don't know if you can see these pictures. You want to get a little bit closer? Okay. So, um, Pastor Kate asked this question to the congregation this week. What art has shaped your understanding of God? And my answer to that this time was rainbows have shaped my understanding of God as a reminder of my daughter Esther and a sign that God is with me. And you can see these rainbows and one there. Um, these two photographs are rainbows that we have at home. This one, we have a well, anyway, we've got a gigantic one, but I couldn't bring it with me. So in the Bible, uh, they talk about rainbows in Genesis 9, and this is what it says about rainbows. I've set my rainbow in the clouds, 
and it will be a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I'll remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So how many of you have seen rainbows in the sky? Everybody? Will, have you seen a rainbow in the sky before? Maybe? So what colors do you see in rainbows? Have you seen a double rainbow? Me too. How about you? Anybody else seen a double? Yeah. Yeah. So what colors are in the rainbows? Yeah. And some and what? And pink is always there. Good thing. Okay. Well, let's not have a disagreement. I think you've covered all, all the cover, colors that I... What would you call that? Yes, it is a double. And? Also a double. So we have several photographs of double rainbows in our house <clears throat> that were taken May 28, 2005, which is a long time ago. These rainbow photographs our art, and they have special meaning to me. They remind me of the love I have for our daughter, Esther, who died in a car accident at the same time that these rainbows showed up after the accident. So if you see the double rainbows, this one was in Lewistown, which is in Mifflin County. And this one, same time, was in Oakland Mills in Juniata County. Now, friends took these pictures, not knowing what was happening, and they gave them to us later on. Our photos and rainbows in the sky remind me of our daughter Esther and that God will never leave me. Even, even in, in troubling times, God shows up through rainbows and friends and family. And God brings hope and comfort to us through rainbows, friends, family, and a lot of other things. Thank you for sharing my rainbows. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for beautiful rainbows and for reminders that you are always with us. Amen. You can go back to your seats. Psalm 19, 1. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims God's handiwork. All right. You may stand again if you'd like and turn to 437. Um, we will sing this just verse 1, refrain, verse 2, refrain, verse 3, refrain, um, but it's a little bit laid out unusually on the page. So if you want to just glance, we'll sing straight through to what looks like the end, return to the refrain, which is in the middle, and then when you see the double bar with the fine, we will go back to the beginning where you will find verse 3. So verse 2 is sort of by itself at the end. It's a little bit odd looking, but uh, we'll, we'll catch what we can. All right. Thank you.
whom shall I fear? I invite you to join me in receiving the breath from the one who calls us his own. And pray with me. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, a couple weeks ago, Carl Keener gave me an article entitled, Female Birds Sing Too. Science is better when it's inclusive. It started out saying, despite the well over 1,000 scientific publications about barn swallows, female barn swallow song had never previously been the focus of a research article. And the article goes on to explore why female bird song has rarely been studied. There are several reasons, the author says. One is that conventional evolutionary theory that has males vying for female attention means males sing more. Another is that researchers tend to study what's close by. And in North America, female birds that migrate long distances have adapted to sing less. And the third reason is that up until recently, the research on birds has been dominated by men. Women are much more likely than men to be the first authors on papers of female birdsong. The author of this article, a woman, concludes, the historical lack of diverse participation in science may have contributed to researchers forming self reinforcing assumptions, self-reinforcing assumptions that impede a full understanding of the world around us. So hold on to that idea. Who does the investigating, the creating, the writing? When it's only a certain population, the diversity of exploration tends to be diminished. And we tend to create theories and ideas and images that look like us. So I want to explore today what our images of God are. Actually, most of them are of Jesus the Christ because God is too mysterious for most to capture. So I wanna explore these images and who created them. Do they fit our current understanding? And what happens when we become more inclusive in our vision of who Jesus the Christ might be? How might that bring more of an understanding to the fullness of God and Christ? This picture, I wonder how many of you know this picture? It has been made, reproduced more than 500 million times. 500 million times. It dates back the original one to the mid 1930s when students at McCormick Theological Seminary in Chicago voted a black and white sketch of this as the most accurate portrayal of Jesus. Well, a publisher of religious materials in Indianapolis bought the rights to it and in 1940 went on to copyright this colored version of Solomon's picture, the head of Christ. Wallet-sized versions were distributed to soldiers and sailors during World War II. We find it in many, many places. So how does this picture influence our understanding of Jesus? He looks like he could be related to me. Makes me feel like I belong to this guy. And over time, I've come to see that something's not quite right about that. Comforting, maybe, but Jesus likely didn't look a whole, like, a whole lot like me or like Mr. Salman's depiction. So we have that picture. I want you to notice throughout this sermon as we're looking at different images, which ones resonate with you, which ones make you feel comfortable, and are there some that you might feel uh, a little anxious about? I was sent this picture this week by Ben, an image that at first I thought was wrong because that's not what the picture was originally named. But it's how it's been renamed and it reshapes one way we may understand God. 
I learned that early images of God were often made to look like the gods of Greek myths. The artists were referring to other gods the people of that era would know. So Zeus is changed to represent God, the God, creator of the universe, the one who brought all things into being and said that it was good. This is how God was imagined by the Italian painter Sima di Conaligiano around the year 1500. God, as known to the people in the 1500s. This picture is reinterpreted as God is from a 1940 contemporary understanding of the goddess Venus. It's been reinterpreted by a woman here at Penn State. So notice, what's familiar, what's unfamiliar? How does it sit with us? For most of us, we've had to do some mental undoing over the years. We see images like that white bearded God in the heavens and that was that, no questions asked. We saw this masterpiece from the Italian artist Michelangelo painted on the ceiling of the Vatican Sistine Chapel in the early 1500s. The frescoes here illustrates God giving life to Adam as part of the two biblical creation stories. It references Genesis 1:27 that says, God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, they were created. Male and female, they were created. Likely, we haven't seen this image, one reshaped by the Afro-Cuban artist Harmonia Rosales. So what happens when we see ourselves or don't see ourselves in these images of the divine? Do we, like those scientists studying birdsong, miss the vast complexity and beauty that surrounds us? We heard those beautiful words in the Psalms. One thing, one thing I ask of the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek God in God's temple. We heard about the handiwork, the heavens and the firmament proclaiming God's handiwork. We come seeking God, desiring to gaze on the beauty of the heavens, all of which proclaim God's handiwork. All of it, all of us. Perhaps all of us show glimpses of the divine. Well, by the middle of the 20th century, the global center of Christianity began shifting away from Europe to Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Christianity around the world was becoming less white, and pictures of Jesus hanging in churches from Jordan to Japan to Jamaica began to look more and more like the people in those places instead of those standard white portraits from Europe and North America. Local artists began doing their own version of Christ. And so I wanna show you some of those images, old and new, to perhaps broaden our vision of Jesus, of God incarnate. We have here the Pantocrator. The, that Greek word Pantocrator literally means he who has authority over everything. He who has authority over everything. In order to represent such mighty qualities, the Byzantine artists of the one on the right made use of features such as an open right hand, which conveyed a sense of power and authority. This image on the left is the oldest known example we have of Christ Pantocrator in the world. The different expressions of that one face, the one on the left, might suggest the double nature of this person, of Jesus, as both human and divine. So just notice what it is to hold both of these side by side, seeing images of he who has authority over everything.
Here's one of the earliest artistic depictions we have of Jesus. It dates to the third century and it's painted on a wall of a catacomb in Rome showing Jesus carrying a calf on his shoulders. Third century. Let's take a look at images from those around the world. What did Jesus look like? In the 1500s, for those in Italy, here was Jesus. For those of us who might be moviegoers, we might know this one from the Passion of Christ. Here is Stanley Rayfield, an African-American's an African understanding of Jesus. This one, known as Third Day, is by Emmanuel Garabe, a painter from the Philippines who often focuses his work on expressing the struggles of the common man from his context. In Indian art, Jesus is often seen as peaceful, not as one who suffers. Here, Dr. Solomon Raj, artist and theologian, shows Jesus as teacher, sitting on a lotus flower much like the Buddha, the lotus being a symbol of purity. Greg Weatherby, an Australian of Aboriginal descent, absorbs Jesus into Aboriginal storytelling, depicting Jesus and his followers as Mimi, spirit beings with elongated bodies who taught the, original, the Aboriginal peoples practical life skills and gave them their culture. In this image here, Jesus is crucified in front of Ayers Rock, a place of mystery for the Aboriginal peoples. By absorbing Jesus' death into Aboriginal myth, Weatherby suggests that Jesus' story, too, has sacred significance and is for his people. The Chinese-born artist James He Kui depicts Christ sitting in the still waters he blends Chinese folk customs and modern Western art. This artist shows Jesus as a Maori man with that full-faced moko, the traditional tattoo. Kelly Latimer, a St. Louis artist, portrays the Holy Family. Kelly's work is contemporary and often provocative. His images ask us, how can we shape a culture of Christianity where love has no boundaries? How do we create a world where that Jesus, that young one, would be cherished? There are many images of Bible stories, and I want to look at a few from the Last Supper. So notice which are familiar and which ones might challenge you. We have this one, The Last Supper by Da Vinci. We have this one by Sarah Jenkins, a queer artist from Northern Appalachia. The ink strip of parchment from Ethiopia features a black Jesus at the Last Supper. This image is apparently ubiquitous in this country. Modern paintings not much bigger than the size of a sheet of paper like this of the Last Supper are found throughout Ethiopia. So as Laura mentioned, last week I put out a call. I said, how do you envision God? And I only got a few responses, but I want to show them to you. Micah Schoenberg sent me this one, the Angelus, the angels, painted around 1858. This is what Micah says, how this t touches him. This painting calls to mind the great cloud of witnesses, 
all the ordinary people throughout history who have ordered their lives, not only according to planting and harvesting the seasons of nature, but also by daily rhythms of prayer and the circle of the church calendar. Do we find God in these images? Check out this one that Ben sent me. Ben writes, in high school, I started listening to the Christian new metal band, Pod. Is it P-O-D, Ben, or Pod? P-O-D. This album art for their breakthrough album, The Fundamental Elements of Southtown, stood out to Ben for a variety of reasons. He writes, I didn't realize Christian music could be so edgy, challenging, and controversial. And there were so many details to obsess over their possible meaning. It made a deep impression on me, he writes, that it was possible to challenge systems and assumptions while re remaining rooted and grounded in a faith tradition. Art can open us wide, it can challenge us and inspire us, it can make us think outside our comfortable understandings. And art can also remind us. This is my image, a picture I took a couple weeks ago, entitled, We Live in a Christ-Soaked World. Mulberries are something I see as a gift of incredible abundance. That day I stopped on a trail and ate and ate and picked and picked, my fingers stained purple, my belly happy. But I also see these trees as a real pest. They're nearly impossible to get rid of once they grow too big. Their roots go deep and spread wide. They challenge me. How do I, how do I choose at any moment to meet creation? Do I find God in the abundance that's provided generously and freely? Do I find God in the struggle of trying to yank out those things that don't serve me or the land well? This week, I hope you pay attention, and even as we move into Arts Fest, notice how art can open us, challenge us, inspire us, make us think outside of our comfortable understandings. Notice, where do you experience God the Creator, Jesus the one who fed, who was peaceful, who suffered? Where do you experience the movement of God in your life. Send some pictures. Time is a good thing, it's a good thing, it's 그 좁은 길로 가기 원해 나의 작음을 알고 그분의 크심을 알며 소망 그 깊은 길로 가기 원하네 빛옷은 산이 되기보다 가는 길만 비추기보다는 누군가의 길을 비춰준다면 내가 노래하듯이 또 내가 얘기하듯이 할길나 그렇게 죽기 원하네 삶의 한 절이라도 그분을 담기 원하네 사랑 그 깊은 길로 가기 원하네 그 높은 길로 가기 원하네 Before communion, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. 
Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Communion. We begin with confession, naming those places where we separate ourselves from God's love. And then we move into this act of connecting ourselves with the love of Christ. We fall short and yet we come. We come not because we are strong and confident in our understandings. Oftentimes we come simply because we're hungry hungry for something that the world cannot give. So you, each one here, no matter what brings you to the table today, know that you are welcomed. Join me in this invitation to communion. Let's say this together. Ben, can you move? There we go. Join me. At the table of Christ, we eat this bread and drink this cup to remember the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, to be united with Christ and with one another at the church, and to look toward a time when all will be one. As we eat and drink with thanksgiving, Jesus Christ is present with us and we are empowered by the Spirit to follow Jesus' way of love as the body of Christ, broken and blessed for the life of the world. We are empowered, my friends, by the power of the Spirit of Christ to live out the brokenness and the blessedness before the world. And so we come, we come and we gather around a table, a table in some ways similar and in some ways so different from that one that Jesus gathered around with his friends. But we remember that night. We remember when he took a simple loaf of bread and blessed it, giving thanks to God, blessed it and broke it, and hand it around to person after person around that table, each one broken and blessed in their own ways. He said, take and eat and remember, remember the love that I share with you, born out of brokenness. And when the meal was finished and they were gathered around the table still, he took the cup and he poured it. He poured it and passed it around to each one, to each one who was thirsty in their own ways. And he said, drink, drink and be filled, for this is the blood shed for you, shed to make life new for you, that you no longer need to be afraid, but you can come as a blessed and broken people. So each one here is invited. This table is open for anyone. If your walk with Jesus is strong, you are welcomed. If you're not sure what you believe or where you belong, but you're hungry and thirsty, you are welcome here. I invite the servers to come forward. The elements are gluten-free. I 
I invite you to come forward and take the bread and the cup and go back to your seats and we will partake together. My friends, brothers, sisters, siblings in Christ, come, the table is set. Christ the host welcomes you. Come and eat. Together, we take the bread, eat the bread, remember that this was broken for you. And we drink the cup together as a body, remembering that it is Christ who quenches our thirst. I invite you to join me, join me in saying the Lord's Prayer together to bring this time of communion to a close. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, 
as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We share at the table together and we share in one another's lives in so many different ways. You are invited to share <clears throat> the joys, the sorrows, the doubts, the questions, the ways you have been stretched. Share as part of the community of faith. I invite you to stand if you want to say something, to uh, wait for a microphone and tell us your name, and let us know how we can pray together. And we will hold each sharing as a prayer. I will say, God of love, and invite you to respond. Hear our prayer. Those on Zoom are also welcomed to unmute and share with us as well. I'm Hope Bree Baker. I'm requesting prayer for my granddaughter, Riley, who because of complications at birth, suffered some kidney damage. She got word this week that her kidney functioning is failing to the point that the doctor feels she needs to go on dialysis. She's waiting for a kidney transplant, which is in the process. Uh, several people are being tested, and yet it's very discouraging to get to that point where no, my kidneys aren't functioning good enough to keep on going. And so I would just ask that somehow or other God miraculously would work in providing a kidney for her and making that new life be able to be given to her. We hold Riley up before the God of miracles and healing. God of love, hear our prayer. Jim Rosenberger, uh, we feel very blessed. Uh, we had a, a safe and adventuresome trip, Gloria and I and my brother, Henry and his wife. And then when we returned uh, the day after, or 4th of July, my brother, my, old, my oldest living brother's uh, funeral was held and uh, the surviving five members of my family uh, of the 10 that we uh, grew up together with um, were, were all there and uh, we had a wonderful celebration of his life. He was 93 and died peacefully. So. We hold the celebration of Mark's life and the celebration of beauty that you shared with us this morning. God of love, hear our prayer. Hi, Micah Tillman on Zoom. Uh, just letting you all know that Ruth arrived safely in Australia for the conference that she is a keynote speaker for. Uh, and also, so I don't uh, interrupt again later, uh, this is, today is our 17th wedding anniversary, so. Congratulations to you both from afar. And we give thanks for Ruth's safety. May she be blessed in this time in Australia. God of love, hear our prayer. Leslie Webb was not able to be here today, but this Tuesday she is scheduled to be in Danville for a heart ablation a procedure she has been waiting for for a long time. So holding Leslie this week. God of love, hear our prayer. Let's hold a moment of silence for those unspoken prayers deep within us.
God, you who created, who saw the creation and said it was good. We come sometimes struggling to see the goodness. We come sometimes with such abundance in our hearts. We come this morning having been nourished and ask you to hear us, to hear the need for healing, the thanksgiving of gathering with family, for anniversaries that can happen half a world apart and yet the love is strong. We hold those around the world who suffer, suffer from violence, suffer from not having enough to eat, suffer from not knowing where they might sleep this night. May we be transformed, O Holy One. May we be transformed by this Christ-soaked world you have blessed us with. May we share your love with those we meet. May we see you in the faces of those around us. Guide us, O Lord, and show us your way. In your holy name, amen. Are there any announcements that need to be made? Do we have any visitors with us today? And if so, would you be willing to stand up and introduce yourself? Okay, do we have birthdays this week? Paul McCormick's kind of a birthday. It's a birthday for Jess and I and our marriage. Uh, it's our 14th wedding anniversary on Wednesday. Congratulations. This is a little belated, but we haven't been here for a few weeks, so we'll turn six on June 26th. Ken and I are celebrating our 46th wedding anniversary tomorrow. Oh, congratulations. This is an announcement and a birthday message. I usually take the week of my birthday off, so I will be gone this coming week. Next Saturday, I will uh, be with my family celebrating a big one for me. I'm turning 60, so. Uh, grateful for that, and please turn to one of the elders if there is a need. So I should have opened that up for birthdays or anniversaries. <laughs> I cheated a little bit and went on the directory just to look them up, and I did notice that it is Ruth and Micah's anniversary, and I knew that they were away from each other, so... Happy anniversary to you. <laughs> um, who would like to sing happy birthday or start us off? I'm not leaving that. And please stand for the benediction. May the God of glory, the word of life, and the spirit of truth bless you all, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>